Okay, hey everyone, it's Annette Densham here, and I'm going live with the incredible Nance Haxton, and um, I've lost her. She's gone. Uh, Rupert Murdoch might have heard that we were going to have a go at him today, so um, I'm going to hope that she ch joins back in any second now, and um, I, I might just keep chatting to you in the meantime, because this is a, a subject that I feel very strongly about. And here she is. There you go, Annette. What happened there, Annette? We're back. I started without you, so I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I just, I just kept talking. I went. She's. <laughs> come, I thought, thought maybe Rupert Murdoch might have heard us and like come in and interrupted our transmission just to go. No, stop. I know you're going to say things about me. No, but no, of course. <laughs> for you, for all of those who have tuned in and listening later, I'm joined by the incredibly talented. Nance Haxton. Now, Nance has now, got the only like... problem, Annette, is my um, wi my Wi-Fi is, of course, being a pain. So I'm just going to ah. put it onto mobile data, and I'll see if I can hear you a little bit better. Okay, no worries. I'll finish introducing. Just stop you dropping out. Yeah, you can't. We can't be dropping out here. This is an important topic. So Nance has 20 years in uh, journalism. Can you hear me? Unfortunately, you've completely frozen on me. <laughs> Isn't this always the way? The it's joys always of technology. the way. I so love technology. It's um, my favourite thing ever. It must have dropped out because of the Wi-Fi before. So, uh, Can you see me? Can you hear me, darling? I'm hearing about every fifth word, I think. Yeah. Oh, no. Do you want to log out and hop back in? Can I try and get back? I'll, yep. try, and if... I'll try and make another connection maybe. Okay. Okay, now, whenever we have a very serious conversation, it seems the internet, like, gets in the way. But Nance is going to try and hop back in. If we have any problems, um, we might see if we could organise to talk to her again because we are talking about something really important um, and I, it, it impacts all of us in a way. Here she is. Let's see if this works. Okay. Okay. What That's do you reckon? Better. Are we cooking with gas? Oh, we are finally. Yay, yay. Okay. Apologies well, I haven't, fi I haven't finished introducing you, so that's a good thing that everyone can see your beautiful face. Okay, hey. on your screen right now, live in person, is <laughs> multi-award winning journalist Nance Haxton. Nance has worked for the – or did work for the ABC for many, many years, and she has built a really rock-solid reputation – for tackling the big stories, you know, juicy, meaty stories filled with facts and research, you know, the, the type of things that, that the media was meant for. So I thought, you know, why don't we have a chat about what's going on in Australian media? Nance, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Annette. I'm honoured you'd pick me. That's very nice. Well, I really enjoy, I love what you've done since leaving the ABC is The Wandering Journo. And I'm sure that you've got many stories. I've loved watching you interview uh, journalists who I admire and respect. And um, I'd have to say you're up there for me as one of those journalists that I admire and respect. And I kind of thought this is a really important topic, the the where Australian media is going. So we saw last week that News Limited announced that it was closing regional newspapers um, mm -hmm. Not long ago, they announced that they were going to withdraw on publishing suburban newspapers. Um, Bauer Media kind of culled seven glossy magazines. Fairfax over the last few years have retrenched hundreds of journalists. What are we looking at in terms of Australian media? What's, mm -hmm. what's going to happen from mm -hmm. here? And AAP as well. And, and AAP, just, oh, just absolutely. Yep, uh, all of those. Um, it's been a bit of a perfect storm, I think, unfortunately, um, the last month or two. Um, and, look, we could, you know, some may be kind and blame it on coronavirus, but I think it's been coming for a long time. Uh, the, 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 the finances of newspapers have been struggling for a long time. But, you know, there are contrasting stories with that as well. I mean, you know, it is the New York Times, but... They report of 
um, having a boom in subscriptions now. And that's really, I think, what's needed. We need to show our support for these publications. We can't just kind of sit back and go, wow, you know, they keep cutting all my little newspapers. But if we're not reading them, if we're not really engaged, then they're going to go. So I, you know, being a classic journalist, I suppose I can see both sides of that argument a little bit. Do you think that we undervalue our news and we expect to get it for free? Because like this, I, I know as a content writer, that's people really undervalue the work that goes into putting together good quality content. Do you think that maybe that is also part of the problem? Oh, definitely. I mean, journalism has never been a highly paid profession. Um, the margins have always been pretty low. But I think since uh, the rivers of gold and the classifieds have dried up, um, it's certainly been a lot more difficult for for organiza- these organisations to, to get by. Um, but I don't know, like I, I'm also a, a, a teacher of journalism at university at Griffith and at other universities as well. And I'm always constantly telling my students, they must they tell me to shut up after a while, just get out into the bush, you know, like get out uh, into beyond the black stump and beyond where you grew up because that is where you learn your craft. And I suppose there's part of me that's just incredibly sad that I think that option is going. And having lived in these organ- in these areas like Port Augusta where I made – you know, that's where I really made my mark as a journalist. It's where I learnt my craft uh, by going to a place that I knew nobody, to a state where I knew nobody and learning how to make contacts. Um, it, and already that ABC studio there is no longer there. That newspaper there is no longer there. These are people, like, I got a Walkley Award there for an hour up the road at the Warrant Detention Centre because... I was the only one there and I drove up in my car and stood up on top of a petrol station when there was a riot there. So it's not that there's not news there. So this whole system is broken. How do we fix it? I mean, there are there are many scholars trying to figure this out, but it is a pretty grim situation at the moment, just how it's all come to a head, I think. Mm. Mm. And it's, and I don't, like I, I go back, you know, old school print journalist, you know, I started at, Southwest News as a work experience kid and it was there that, you know, I learnt, you know, it was, it was only a week but it really um, underpinned for me the value of, of words and of asking questions of, and, and I always learnt, there's one thing that I still remember is that the use of redundant words and still today yes. I'm still like going to people, you really don't need to use very, it's an intensifier that's mm. redundant. Right. <laughs> you never use that. You don't need or that. that. And it, that's one of the things I bang on about to my students as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We could do a whole <laughs> talk about that and it intensifies, couldn't we? <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. for for you as a, you know, like, like, like me, you're looking at these, all of these closures, what are we going to see in terms of editorial quality? Because if we don't have AAP, you know, out there, scrounging up the news and we've got students who can't go out to the bush and learn that you don't need to use that and and how to be resourceful and resilient what are we going to see in terms of editorial quality i think that's what we have to make that connection to people that it is going to go down that people complain about journalism and i think you know in in many ways i've got a fair beef there's some pretty poor journalism around um but Annette, that's where I started with my Journo Project podcast that you mentioned. I really wanted to celebrate good journalism because I don't think that we celebrate it enough, particularly good Australian journalism. We hear about Pulitzer Prize winners and we hear about the New York Times. We, we don't really celebrate these amazing journalists that we've grown here, like Jared Ryle, who's now gone on to become the head of the International uh, Investigative Journalism Um sort of bureau. So we we need to celebrate these people and their achievements and the fact that they the work they do lead to royal commissions, you know, and lead to change. Um, I think we can get very cynical and go, oh, you know, we've had so many royal commissions, but this is these are the the the, the changes that that shape our society. Uh, I think I was very lucky 
growing up in Queensland. And I started at the Wynnum Herald as a, as a cadet journalist as well. And I'm very thankful for that because you do learn your craft in such a beautiful way, even though my editor made me cry every week because he was such a stickler. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> and I'm sure I you have been yelled at too. by many. <laughs> Yes, that's the newsrooms that uh, they wouldn't get away with these days, Annette. But, uh, yes, it, yeah. um, but I, I just, I really do mourn for what people don't realise they're going to lose, which is uh, things like the Moonlight State. When I, That's what made me become a journalist, you know, growing up in Joe Bielke-Peterson era in Queensland and seeing Chris Masters come to the absolute definitive hour-long summary of why I was feeling so e uneasy, even as a 12, 13 year old, like not really feeling comfortable with these protests going on and all these strikes that I couldn't make sense of. Um, and that led to enormous change in the end of the Joe Bielke peterson in era. If we don't support good journalism, and that includes in these little regional communities, um, then we, we, we really are putting democracy itself at risk. That's not overstating it. We need to value journalism as the fourth estate and a really crucial part of democracy and society. Mm. Oh, I, and like you speaking to the converted, although I think I saw someone <laughs> post today that um, mainstream media is just filled with fake news and that it's driven by political and business agendas, you know, like I, I can remember when I worked for News Limited and um, Paul Keating was, you know, that was then be becoming Prime Minister and the, the Daily Telegraph had such a, a slant towards the Labor government and, I, and I, it always sat really badly with me because mm. I always thought that journalism was about you know, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, you know, let's present both sides to the stories. And it mm. seems even more now that our journalism is so tipped to one side or the other, it's hard to really fathom what's truth and what's not. At times it is, and I think it's another reason to to celebrate the really good contemporary news um, reporting as well. So like Kate McClymont's of this world who I interviewed on my podcast, you know, the investigative work that she's done repeatedly over the years to expose corruption in New South Wales. Um, you know, I think there is, there's poor and shoddy work in most professions, um, but we need to hold up and we, we, we can't lose sight of the, the importance of journalism as, 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 as for, for, for protecting our society. I mean, otherwise, do we want to live in a totalitarian regime in China? I mean, great, you know, let's, let's you know, have a great export relationship. But I don't want my freedoms of speech to be further impinged by being told what to report. You know, it's, mm. it's a slippery soap that, that you, if, if we keep losing these outlets for important local journalism, as, and as we know, even in those suburban newspapers, Who's going to report that now? Those stories that, you know, I was a finalist in the Walkley Awards for back when I was basically a second or, or third year journalist. You're not going to do that unless you're based at Wynnum. I mean, we're, you're not going to do that from Bowen Hills. You, you have to be in that community. You have mm. to have a relationship with your contacts and it, it's a reciprocal relationship. Mm. I try and encourage people when they get, really dismayed about quality of journalism to look for the good practitioners to follow people's bylines you can still do that even in a digital age you can still do that with abc journalists with with anybody but follow the journalist that you respect hugh remington who i interviewed he's worked for abc on radio national he worked for he still works for channel 10. it's not that you can go commercial media is good bad and abc is good there are good practitioners in there who are standing up in a really difficult environment and trying to keep that balance that we're searching for and the rigours of good, profound journalism keep that alive. Do you think we're going to see the increase of more independent media popping up, you know, like the crikeys who, you know, uh, these disenfranchised journalists from mainstream media have gone, you know what, 
we can actually do a better job if we run our own race. I hope so. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there is there is definitely space for that. Um, it's not lucrative, but it's, as I've found, even with my journal project, but it's fun, which is probably the main reason I became a journalist in the first place. Um, but... Yes, and there's also, I don't know if you noticed, but just today and at the MEAA, which is the Journalists' Union, Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, they've launched a campaign and a petition that maybe some of your um, wonderful you know, viewers can, can look at as well about these severe cutbacks and about the 100 publications that are about to be lost and trying to uh, just fight back about that to get people to sign this petition to say, we value this, we want someone to put some money into this, we don't want these publications lost. Yeah, so I think oh, that's, well, that's an important development too. I've just found the link and I'm going to put it in the chat so that people can sign that because um, we need a voice. Like having worked in PR for many, many years, mm. those regional publications, the suburban publications, were just amazing grounds to help people get that local attention with great storytelling and publications yeah. that are interested in what's going on locally. I totally get your point. Now, as a, mm. as a lecturer, a teacher of journalism, what future is there, you know, is it worth people going into, the, into journalism? I think... Um it's it's a difficult time. I try and encourage my students that it's not grim. I, I think what I the the thing I try to remember is that there has never been a time in it where people have gone. There are heaps of jobs in journalism. Everyone, come on in. Just you know, go to TAFE, do a quick story. Uh, you'll be right, right? Like it has always been incredibly competitive to get into. So that is some comfort. I mean, I remember finishing university, realising pretty quickly I wasn't going to get work for a while and just doing my honours when really I was just ringing chiefs of staff all, all day, every day for a year, just trying to get a cadetship. So it's it's never been easy, but this will make it harder. That's for sure. Um, yeah. So I try and encourage my students that those journalistic skills are handy in a number of industries. Uh, as you say, in PR and communications, uh, if they can't become the journalist that they want to be. But it's, it's almost, I think, sadly, probably in some ways, but becoming a bit like law. There's many ways that you can apply a law degree. You don't just need to become a lawyer. But, mm. um, but I, no, I do hope that there's some hope for our journalism graduates a bit beyond that. Me too. I would hate to be looking down the barrel of that gun at the moment and going, I've just spent three years and um, yeah. uh, my, over half of my options are now gone because, as you said, those regional publications were birthing grounds for really incredible journalists because you learnt at the feet of old school journos, you know, ones who understand what an Oxford comma is. Yes, and look, there are some optimistic stories. I mean, I, I teach or I was teaching a radio journalism subject uh, at Griffith for a number of years. And I can, there's five or six journalists uh, who did that course with me. Uh, and probably half of them didn't weren't interested in radio at all before they did the course, who are now at the ABC. Longreach, Ollie Wickham, uh, who's now moved to Mackay. Jake Kean, and you hear him many mornings on the ABC 745 News with the lead story for, for the evening. So there is still a pathway, but, boy, you've got to be pretty good to get through. Um, it would be great to see uh, more of these publications. I oh, think of Lisa um, from ABC Breakfast, um, Lisa Miller. She started at the Gimpy Times. It's being cut. It's just going to be a website now. She's even put a tweet up about it just saying how dismayed she is. Where are these foreign correspondents of the future going to learn the craft uh, because it is a rigorous uh, environment at a newspaper even if it is for Gympie or for Wynnum or for the southeast suburbs of Brisbane you need somewhere that journalists can can make a contribution to a community and hopefully learn the skills that they need to go on to to live in London and work over there. Mm, I almost feel like I need a tissue now Nance. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it is really heartbreaking. Work. 
It is a grim <laughs> week. It's week for us to talk about it. That's for sure. Oh, I know. But it has, I think it's been a grim few years because I know when yeah. I started in PR, you know, I could send out a media release and, well, I could never guarantee a story. I had a lot more luck, you know, that the winds were flowing fairly thick and fast that you could, if you understood mm -hmm. how to pitch and you understand what a good story angle was, you could go, okay, That's right. I'm in. But in the last 12 months, I almost feel like there's a brick wall between me. Um, you know, it, it's almost impossible to get a journalist on the phone anymore. Um, I that, know. That, they don't talk to you. They don't want to talk to you. Which because I find, they're so busy. They're yeah, so, so busy. Many comebacks, they're so busy. Yeah. yeah. And I know, and it breaks my heart because it's like mm. you're missing out on so many great stories. How do you yes. feel about this rise in, um, you know, I see a lot in um, Twitter feeds that form the basis of the news. Like I read a whole one mm. today about The Voice and, it was all just these screenshots of someone's tweets about Guy Sebastian and how he shouldn't be inviting his friends onto The Voice. Like, what do you think? Is, is that because they're so busy that they're just grabbing whatever they can find? I mean, it's true. There is sort of that entertainment journalism focus too and that's the unfortunate response from the clicks. If, if they're just going to be counting clicks, then there's more of that stuff that's going to be produced. But uh, I think as from a journalist perspective, I suppose when, I, when I'm working in the industry, as I still freelance now, and certainly in my time at the ABC when I was there for 20 years, Twitter was just one of many tools. I saw it as a tool, but it shouldn't be, you know, the backbone of your, hey, I've got a new story about it on Twitter this morning. Um, it, it can give you new angles onto stories, but uh, it's almost, it, it's like any smorgasbord really. Uh, Annette, if you eat too much of any of those things, you're going to make yourself sick. So you need to be picking a lot from all the different contacts, uh, your local police station, the the people that you meet down at the fish and chip shop. Um, you, you, you know, th this is, you never know when you're going to meet your best, your next contact. It's a bit like making friends. You just never know when that's going to be and you, um, you need to treasure those contacts. A journalist is only as good as their, their contacts and unique contacts that other people don't have. Mm, absolutely. Otherwise, you're just fishing in the same pond, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> well, Nance, it's and been... <laughs> no, continue. Just, oh. it, just, it, it just reminded me of even the big investigative story that I did in South Australia uh, Annette, and I, I do quite often get asked by people, you know, how do we as journalists find stories? Uh, and I think, you know, we can demystify it a bit. It's not as black magic as people think it is. I remember the the court reporter coming into the news uh, into the newsroom, and she was crying. Um, and this is a court reporter. You know, they see a lot of stuff, as you know, Annette. So I knew something was not good. Uh, and basically, it turned out that led to a six month investigation that I did just by going up to her and asking what's wrong. Uh, and basically it was a, an awful case. It was a, a sexual abuse case, but uh, all the charges were going to be dropped against this man who was a bus driver of six intellectually disabled children who, you know, were all sexually abused, but because they were intellectually disabled, they weren't able to give evidence in, in a traditional court of law. So she was just devastated. And from there I did that investigation Three years later, uh, and a walk, after a Walkley Award, they passed legislation to change the Evidence Act in South Australia. Uh, it took that long, but, you know, I am more proud of that, changing legislation or being part of that. I'm not saying my story was the only part of that. But these, you've got to raise, you've got to put light in the darkness, Annette, for parliaments to listen and go, that's not right. We need to change that Evidence Act so that everyone is equal before the law. I'm, I'm prouder of that than any Walker Award. That's I what good journalism is. That's a cool thing to be proud of. And for people who've got a story like that or an inkling, how, what, what advice do you give to them to get some traction or cut through with journalists who don't pick up the phones anymore or are centralising um, where all yep. the stories are funnelled through? I think you've got to think of 
uh, not just your newspapers. You, you can. There are there are amazing journalists. Again, you're following that byline. Natasha Beaker, an amazing journalist who does lots of social justice stories that I'm interested in. But radio is a great place to start off. There's so many great stories that have started with a bit of talk back on ABC Radio. So looking at it as a, as a long game rather than a one hit as well. So you might just start at ABC and then you'll ring um, other organisations from there and say, I heard this on the ABC and this should be followed up. Um, so there, there are other ways rather than just trying to go through the traditional channels. I think going through the old chief of staff and um, that's not as successful as it used to be. There are lots of comp competing factors now and newsrooms yep. are very pushed. It's about personal relationships, making personal yeah. relationships. Oh, so agree with you. Oh, mm. absolutely. And I As think journalists, we're not all bad in it. We can have a coffee, have coffee, and we, we can have a chat. We can have a chat. <laughs> I, I, when I used to teach people how to do their own PR, that's what I would say. Journalists are people too, you know. Yeah. And it's like a, you know, not that scary. No, <laughs> and the chances are, is you know, back when there was regional and, and suburban papers, is I'd say there's probably a kid on the other end of the phone who's young enough to be your son or daughter, who's probably more scared of you than you are of them. So That's just right. be nice. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> hurt. But you, you've, you've, meant, you've, you've tipped, touched on something really important there that it's, it's a symbiotic relationship that yeah. even with, you know, that these publications dwindling away, we still as a community have a responsibility to speak up and mm. keep pushing if it's something really important because eventually someone will pay attention. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Annette. You know, we need to see it as a as a two-way street. We need to value the, these uh, value journalism and also feel that we can pass on information about stories. Journal no journalist worth their soul uh, doesn't want to hear a, a good leak. You know, ring up and, and tell somebody. Think of their deadlines. Don't ring at 5 o'clock at night if they're doing the ABC News, at, you know. 7 o'clock, but maybe 9.30 in the morning, ring up with a bit of a tip for Josh Bavis or some fantastic journo that you've really seen their work and really respect. Five minutes chat is not going to cost you anything. No, and it's really not as scary as what you think it is because what's the no. worst thing that can happen? They go, no. Nah. They say, sorry. Thanks yeah. anyway. Hopefully yeah. we'll catch up another time. Yeah. Switchboards. They're an amazing thing, Annette. You don't need direct phone. Switchboards. They're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you got the inside tip there, people. Nance, Try the thank, you. thank you so <laughs> much for those insights and for the conversation. No and it, it so sounds like we've all got a part to play in this. And um, I've put the link for, for the MEAA's petition, um, the, the chief executive, the ACM, to see if we can uh, shake up a little bit. And, and don't be afraid to reach out to the media that's left um, or Absolutely. even create your own, own media and push your stories out there. Certainly plenty of platforms. Nance, I look forward to seeing more from you. Thanks, uh, You're a rock star. Great chatting. Bye. See ya. <laughs>